it's a pleasure to present today in this online format of the 3D printing conference. Um, and I'm delighted to share your, our recent findings under the title Aligning Molecular and Structural Dynamics in Additive Manufacturing um, of Thermoplastics. And the aim is that we want to go to improved weld mechanics and geometrical stability. Um, so as you realize, this is all about timing and um, adequate timing and talking about time. It was actually six years ago, I checked it this morning, uh, six years ago, June 2014, that Peter uh, gave me floor at another 3D printing conference. Um, and I, I presented my perspective, my ideas about the use of thermoplastics in additive manufacturing particularly fuse deposition modeling. And this is where I met Michiel, Michiel van der Klee, who by now is a good friend because we spoke many times at different conferences. Um, and Michiel demonstrated at that moment in time about yeah, six years ago, his ACK project, where I think these images give a nice illustration about the idea. And he explicitly and very nicely used the design freedom and the freedom in geometry that additive manufacturing uh, entails. Um, so in this picture, you see the, the egg where none of the building blocks are the same. They're all different, printed all over the globe with beautiful messages sent back to Michiel's uh, 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 work, workplace um, to be assembled into this object. And it was his dream to go inside, to walk inside and enjoy how light comes in by these different facets. Um, but unfortunately, you can't walk inside. The problem if you walk inside is that these blocks cannot withstand the load that the weight of a person imposes on the block. So you may think that, oh, I use a certain Thermoplastic material, it should be possible, but sadly it doesn't work. And especially over time, things get worse because these blocks, not all of them have been printed under the same conditions, which means that some of them are partially crystalline, some of them have crystallized to its maximum extent, but due to these variations, you get stress accumulation and these elements break apart. It's just a matter of time. So this is a perfect example of a mismatch in expectations. And of course, here we talk about aesthetics and it was a great success. But if you want to move towards engineering applications to real applications of products that are mechanically loaded, then there is a mismatch in expectations, which was in 2013 identified as a, one of the main reasons that limits mass adoption of thermoplastics in 3D printing. And that was actually the whole reason why I decided to work on it and to write a project proposal which was granted by the Dutch government together with the Hogeschoolzeit and some industrial partners to study how should we design thermoplastics on molecular scale to control good properties and to to, to match the expectations of designers. So what is very nicely illustrated is that unlike metals, polymers are slow. Yeah, polymers are slow. They are here, as you can see, wait, I go into the different pointer. You can see here in this image, a tube. And if you focus on the red polymer chain, it's hindered in motion by its neighboring chains. So we visualize these constraints as a tube and the polymer chain can actually only diffuse forward or backward like a snake, it rotates. Of course, if you look to the main building blocks of a metal, yeah, the primary building blocks can move anywhere in space, motion is fast and it's less hindered. So in this work, this theoretical work of Claire McIlroy, she modeled what happens if you deposit one filament on top of a previous, previously deposited filament, 
what happens exactly? And you can see here that obviously heat transfer takes place. So the warm filament that is placed on top of a previously deposited filament reheats that filament. And at the interface, there is a equilibrium temperature. So the bottom filament will reheat while the top filament will cool down. And together they then cool down below the glass transition temperature after which mobility is gone. So if we want to establish bonding at the interface, let's say at the weld interface, we need molecular mixing. But the diffusion, the mobility of polymer chains is very slow. It's extremely slow and scales in fact with the molar mass. As engineers, we like high molar mass for good mechanical properties, but here, high molar mass is against diffusion. And you can see that if you look at this temperature, if you focus on the pink line, you can see that as you deposit a filament on top of another filament, temperature increases to 160. And in the case of polycarbonate, this polycarbonate, the glass transition is about 110. The time for diffusion is only seconds. We talk about a few seconds. And in these few seconds, the diffusion has to take place. Diffusion here is presented as the interpenetration depth. So that is basically the distance that the chain travels from one strand to another strand. But if we want to have good mechanics, then we need to have the same entanglement density of the bulk. Yeah, entanglements, that these are restrictions, these are restrictions of polymer chains. It's not a knot, but they entangle in one another, and that is the basis of mechanics. So if you want to reach, here you can see in this plot on the x-axis, the number of entanglements of a polymer, so basically the molar mass, and here the entanglement fraction at the weld. And you can see for polycarbonate, which cannot crystallize, but if you, it cannot crystallize that if you want to achieve a weld entanglement fraction of the bulk, so a value of one, you either need to work with very low molar masses. So here we talk about entanglements, 10 entanglements per chain. That's what I would call barely a polymer. Or if you go to higher molar masses, you need to process the material at excessively high temperatures. Yeah, both is not realistic. So typically the entanglement density at the weld is about 50%. And you can correlate this via the equation above to the mechanics of the weld. And that's why you can see here, typically we encounter 50 to 80% of the intrinsic material properties at the weld. So entanglements alone are not sufficient to match the expectations and properties. If you want to realize intrinsic polymer properties at macroscopic or product length scale, we need something else. Just diffusion is not enough. What you could do is that you have a semi-crystalline material, a polymer that can crystallize. Once they have diffused and they mix, then polymer chains that originate from two different strands could co-crystallize in a single crystal, and then you can physically anchor the interface which secures good mechanics. But if you crystallize, few things happen. Not only does the complex viscosity increase, as you can see here in this rheometry experiment, where we focus on polylactides, PLA, 120 degrees, you can see that dependent on the molar mass and the composition of the polymer, we can control the moment of crystallization. But when crystallization happens, you have to realize that the density changes. In the melt, it's 1.15. Semi-crystalline, it's 1.2. So this leads to potential warpage, yeah? Um, especially if a polymer doesn't crystallize to its full extent, which, and I'll come back to that, happens during printing regularly. But the biggest problem is that as soon as crystallization sets in, not only the viscosity increases, 
but molecular diffusion is impeded, it's arrested. So it is very important to align the time scales of a process and the polymer. So this is what we did. We used the uh, Arbola freeformer, and you can see here these, these patterns, the orange and the black lines. These are the temperature patterns in the bottom layer. So as soon as you deposit the material, it cools down. But once the second strand is placed on top, it reheats, it cools down, it reheats, and so forth. Yeah, and then it's important to understand when does crystallization happen? Well, if we come from the high temperature and we cool down, the driving force for crystallization increases. And that can happen either during the melt, those are these top lines, yeah, or upon reheating. So if you do not allow a polymer to crystallize upon deposition, for example, because the cooling rate is too high, then it will crystallize upon reheating. And that's a problem. There is now an intrinsic competition between diffusion and crystallization. And if this is not perfectly aligned, which is barely impossible, it will always be a compromise. We have inferior weld mechanics, volumetric instability because of these differences in density and residual stress failure. Or can it be changed? There was a Friday afternoon that Varun Actually, Varun Srinivas, who is actually just having his PhD thesis approved, um, we had an idea. And we thought, let's use the jewel head of the Arberg, which is also in other printers available, and let's print the left-handed and the right-handed polymer in different strands. So alternatingly, PLLA, as we call it, and then the next layer would be PDLA. Yeah, so it's like your yogurt, left-handed or left, uh, uh, links drying, we say in Dutch, and rechts drying, but left-handed, right-handed. So they are their mirror image. They both have a melting point of 170, low crystallization rate, which allows diffusion. But once they meet, once they mix, something special happens. They can crystallize together in a, what we call stereocomplex crystal, with a melting temperature of 230 degrees. So as they meet, they instantly crystallize. How does this work? Was it just a dream? In fact, no, it's not a dream. And it looks like this. I hope you can see the video. On the left, we have the PDLA, lower molar mass. On the right, we have the PLLA, higher molar mass. And since the diffusion of the low molar mass is higher and faster, then for the high molar mass, the DLA diffuses into the LLA. These are molten droplets, yeah? So this is just two particles that are molten together. They fuse together, and at the moment of fusion, you can see that these bright entities appear, which are the polymer crystals. In fact, they are the stereocomplex crystals. So we modeled this in an rheometry experiment modeling basically FDM. So if you have a layered system, we have two layers, two sheets, an L-lactide and D-lactide. And with rheometry, we can follow exactly how the stereo crystals evolve, how fast they go, what's the effect of temperature, what's the effect of time. And then with X-ray diffraction, we can visualize the diffraction peak of the stereo crystals the one from the, what we call homocrystals, the pure polymer. And if we image this at a synchrotron in France, we can exactly find where in space our stereo crystals are. This is FDM. We did the same for SLS. In an SLS system, you can see we have here these powder particles, pre-compacted. And then we do the same experiment. And what is nice that after diffusion, these stereo crystals, in fact, promote the crystallization of the rest. So even if there is no diffusion in the bulk of the filament, its crystallization and thus geometrical stability is secured via the promotion of crystallization. And here again, now with our own FTIR microscope, we have been able to successfully 
visualize where the stereo crystals are, how many there are, and you could argue, is this relevant? Because we see timescales of minutes, eh? so it's one hour experiment, but this one hour experiment helps us to design grades that feature these properties during printing. So this was a very first experiment in SLS where we did at the Brightlands Material Center selective laser sintering on just grinded particles. But even there, you can witness in this differential scanning calority, calorimetry experiment that stereo crystals are being formed during the printing process at the interface of particles. Well, of course, a lot of optimization can be done. And in fact, instead of grinding particles, we're nowadays synthesizing these polymers ourselves with very clear and defined molar mass, very clear L and D ratios, and controlled particle morphology to promote welding and mechanically robust weld interfaces in SLS. In FDM, you can just print it. Uh, you can just buy from Corbion, for example, the PLLA and the PDLA, make filaments, print it where you can see here clearly the interface in a printed object. And again, via FTAR microscopy, we can probe the existence of stereo crystals, which leads in a torsional mechanical experiment on this printed object to an increase of the modulus, the interface modulus of 40%. Well, this is the worst mode of loading the object. So in tensile, the properties are much likely to increase beyond. Now with this, I would like to conclude that interfacial stereocrystallization increases weld mechanics, geometrical, geomet geometrical stability, and durable mechanics in additive manufacturing of thermoplastics. Now, current research focuses not only on polylactides, it's just a very nice material because it crystallizes very slowly, but we're trying to change or introduce these concepts today into polymers that are also ductile in nature, expanding the range in applications. Of course, I have to thank my collaborators, Varun Srinivas, who will be defending his thesis, PhD thesis this year, uh, funding agencies for their support and you for listening.